Hello everyone. We're looking today at a video by Paul Cockshot called Against Hegelian and Platonic Idealism. We're specifically looking at the first half because I know practically nothing about computing, so I won't even try to critique his arguments there. But by way of preface, Cockshot is a computer scientist, quite a smart one, who is also an historical materialist that makes videos concerning science, economics, and socialist theory. Now, having only seen a few videos of Cockshots, which is a sentence that I had to record multiple times to say without laughing, they are for the most part very well put together and thoughtful presentations. Thus, it's with regret that I have to say that this video is not among them, and in fact represents a fairly uncharacteristically sloppy analysis that, while containing some useful and interesting tidbits of information, is nonetheless, if taken too seriously, noxious to learning in general, and it rests upon an unfortunate lack of respect for the subject. I've talked in the past about how respect is essential to understanding. You don't read something you assume to be stupid or pointless in the same way that you read something when you assume that it has something important to say. And Cockshot does not have sufficient respect for Hegel, so this will be a very critical response. Again, no hard feelings to Paul, I generally like his work, in fact I highly recommend some of it. But I can't say that with respect to this latest offering. So without further ado, let's get into it. I'm just doing a short video here based on either videos that other people have done on the YouTube or comments I've received in response to previous videos. And I, they're both linked by a theme of criticism of idealism. And uh, I'll be dealing with what I think is a, a terrible waste of time, which is the influence of Hegelian idealism on the left. And then the influence of Platonic idealism within computing. Now, why bother? You'd have thought Hegel and Plato are long dead. Do they have any influence? Now, it's 183 years, roughly, since Marx and Engels lambasted Hegelianism in their book, The German Ideology. But for some reason, or for a number of reasons, uh, leftists still think it's necessary, necessary to study him. And on the other topic, it, it's around 85 years since Turing put computation on a materialist footing. But notions deriving from Platonic idealism still tend to distract computing science. Again, I know nothing about computing science, so I'll withhold judgment concerning this last point. But as to this supposed lambasting of Hegel, the German ideology wasn't actually published until the 30s. Marx and Engels struggled to find a publisher, and indeed failed. So I think it's a bit off the mark to treat the book as if its arguments have had a long gestation period in the last century of socialist philosophizing. But more importantly, Paul seems to be conflating Marx's critique of the so-called young Hegelians of his own day, especially men like Feuerbach and Stirner, who Marx argues ultimately subsume all relevant social and psychological concepts under the religious, and by extension, all of the problems and contradictions of man's modern condition to a problem of false consciousness. Landing on the absurd conclusion, which Marx characterizes as, despite its radical pretensions, staunchly conservative, that the solution to all of our ills lies in changing how we interpret the world, with Marx's critique of Hegel himself. Now, Marx does lay this tendency partially at the feet of the influence of the Hegelian system, but he also acknowledges elsewhere Hegel's own positive influence on his own work, so that to understand Marx's approach to history, one really needs to have grappled somewhat with Hegel as well. Indeed, in a sense, one is doing so when one is grappling with Marx. Now, that said, Marx does levy strong critiques of Hegel and idealism as well. Critically, he challenged the centering of a dialectical emergence of self-consciousness as the protagonist of history. The intrinsic logic of material forces takes the place of this in Marx. He additionally charges Hegel with enshrining political concepts like the state as necessary emergences for man's essential rational nature when they are themselves, upon a careful historical analysis, the merely contingent products of bourgeois economic relations. <laughs> 
That Marx critiques Hegel, however, is not tantamount to lambasting Hegel's work as a whole, or as construing it as a meaningless waste of time. And even if he does somewhere that I am not aware of, we are perfectly within our rights to critique Marx for this, for making such a reckless claim, because he is not, whatever be his merits as a theorist, the final authority on the matter. Indeed, as Hegel could indicate, we know something about Marx that Marx never could, because we are other than Marx, in fact we're other than Marx's own milieu, and even if Marx were to outright denounce Hegel's influence on his own thought, that influence is still readily visible for us. Now, this guy, Timor, Timor Rahman, is an excellent communist educator and propagandist in Pakistan, and he's written a great book on the class structure of Pakistan. And he has lectures on Marxism and philosophy. And by the tradition of the left, he feels he has to give lectures on Hegel. And they're competent lectures on Hegel. Um, but I really don't think that these lectures are a good idea. Sorry, not that his lectures are a good I aren't a good idea, but I don't think it's a good idea to spend time on this. Uh, far from being uh, a help to people, I think that the ideas they come across in these old works, these pre-materialist works, are a hindrance to intellectual development. The whole edifice is the most awful mysticism and speculation. The, the concepts that uh, he was explaining in his lecture, like being nothingness and essence, really have no part whatsoever in a scientific materialist explanation of reality. Um, they're not ideas that are relied on in any of the contemporary sciences. There aren't any essences. Althusser makes a big point of being an anti-essentialist in philosophy, but it's even more obvious in the context of biology than in the context of history, which he was applying it to. Biologists don't think there is such a thing as an essence. We don't think there is an essence of cat or an essence of oak tree that makes cats catty and oak trees tree-like. What it is, is that they have common genetic codes and the relationship between species is not something imposed on the species by us recognising them. It's a, something that really exists in the degree of shared or different, different genetic codes they have. Now, why, why do people talk about essences? Uh, it was before people knew what the material processes giving rise to biological forms were. Idealist philosophers speculated that there was such a thing as essence. Um, but the, the forms that living things take and the, their relationships come down to actual configurations of atoms and comparative shared sequences in related, sequ in related species. Disregarding for the moment that the left is not entirely encompassed by Marxist thinking, I think Paul massively misunderstands why Marxist theorists and historians and otherwise academics pay attention to Hegel. It's certainly not from a sense of obligation to tradition. What could be more un-Marxist than that? No, it's that Hegel himself is a critical part of world history and indeed of Marx's history. Furthermore, Hegel's theory of self-consciousness has been a powerful tool in the hands of revolutionary theorists like, for instance, Franz Fanon. Often supplementing Marx's theory by filling in the ethical void that he left conspicuously open by referring morality entirely to class. Where otherwise, a wealthy landowner on Marx's view with no sense of compassion for the poor has therefore no reason, save for the gun pointing at his head at the culmination of the revolution, to sacrifice his profits or his property. In Fanon in particular, Hegel is used to assert the full humanity of non-white people's consciousnesses in terms not couched in white bourgeois society. Hegel additionally supplies much insight for philosophy outside of Marx, 
which despite Marx's contempt for the, again, staunchly conservative nature of reducing radical movement to a revolution in mere phrases, is a project essential for our understanding of the world and to understand our place in it. Marx was a philosopher. Without his philosophical education, he could not have thought the stuff in his books that come down to us, and he knew this. This is why even very practically minded revolutionaries like Lenin, whatever else may be said of him, recommended reading Hegel. And not just for the sheer undeniable interest of doing so, but because doing so was essential to fully appreciating Marx. Moving on from this, however, there is an additional aspect of Paul's critique here that I find very suspect. Consider this quote from the German ideology in a section entitled, Premises of the Materialist Conception of History. Quote, The premises from which we begin are not arbitrary ones, not dogmas, but real premises, from which abstraction can only be made in the imagination. They are the real individuals, their activity, and the material conditions of their life, both those which they find already existing, and those produced by their activity. These premises can thus be verified in a purely empirical way, unquote. And then skipping down a few paragraphs, quote, As individuals express their life, so they are. What they are, therefore, coincides with their production, both with what they produce and with how they produce. Hence, what individuals are depends on the material conditions of their production, unquote. So as we can see, materialism is absolutely concerned with essence and being. It is a thesis about these, and what I've just read represents a monistic account of being and essence that relocates the center of movement away from what Hegel called spirit, emerging self-consciousness, to material labor in the world. Marx's critique was of a philosophy that was uncritical of its material foundations, and which acted as a veiled apologia for the material conditions in which philosophers make their wage. He wasn't an idiot who disavowed philosophy for sheer spite of philosophical knowledge and inquiry. Another mistaken idea is the notion taken over from Hegel that there is a logic of nature. There isn't a logic of nature. It's, it's a misleading idea. Logic can only occur when you have patterns of matter that are so configured that they perform logical operations like conjunction, disjunction, negation, etc. And it can be done by various electrical and mechanical devices. Me giving you this video is intimately dependent on there being electrical and mechanical devices that perform logic. For example, I give the simplest possible logic gate really that you can come up with. Here is a, a NOR function, how you would make it out of uh, transistors. You've got a couple of transistors here. When you get a positive charge on either A or B, it, these are pass transistors, and that a positive charge on A allows a current to flow down to, to ground here. So if A is positive, the out thing becomes low. If A is negative and B is negative, both of these are blocked off, and the resistor pulls the out signal high. And that gives you a NOR gate. It's not either A high or B high. Now that's using NMOS transistors, which are now out of date because they use too much power. The drain, the, the pull-up resistor here is constantly um, allowing power to be drawn. So you don't uh, use those now, but I've, I've given the simpler design of a, a gate for, 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 for explanatory purposes. And of course, before people could build them out of transistors, they built them out of relays in, in telephone exchanges. And the early work on uh, applying logic to circuits was based on the assumption that they were using uh, relays. But logic also occurs within cells at enzymatic levels. You get feedback relationships within cells. This is a, an example of a feedback relationship in a cell which 
effectively implements an exclusive or relationship. And uh, the it, it's an exclusive or relationship is operated on on the dependent on the level of glucose and lactate. Now, this kind of, of logic processing exists because it's advantage, um, advantageous to the evolutional survival of organisms to be able to react to their environment. If they're going to do that, they must process information. And this can either be done at a low level enzymatic level within a cell, or it can be approximated in we can approximate what neurons do in terms of uh, logical activities. So logic can also be done by neural networks in nervous systems. And we know that human beings can be trained to do logical deduction. But they can only do this because there's a basic information processing ability in their nervous system which they can make use of to do this logical deduction. But even there, is it really meaningful to say that there's a logic in nature? Are neural nets logical operations? Well, to a limited extent you can do that, but you can say that. But it's a very crude approximation to what nerve cells do. It's more realistic to understand what nerve cells do in terms of um, matrix and vector multiplication run logic. Uh, typical nerve cell symbolically represented here. These are the inputs, there's an output, and what a nerve cell does is it weighs up the inputs by, mathematically we represent this as multiplying a weight by the activation on the input, summing it all out, which gets an activation level in the cell, and we then, if we're mathematically modeling this, we put it through a sigma function, which causes it to be either firing or not firing at the end of it. So, to an extent you can say it's logic, but it's, it's something more sophisticated, really. Except that what Paul's just described is logic. This part's honestly just kind of baffling, so rewinding a little bit. Of course biologists believe in a logic inherent in nature. If there wasn't a logic inherent in nature, then theorizing about the history of life and its emergence on this planet in terms of material processes would be an inherently meaningless enterprise. The world would be effectively unintelligible. It's the logic inherent in the material of our world that makes it capable of being configured into processes like evolution and metabolism and cognition, and which allows us to understand it in those terms. When the quite staunchly materialist Richard Dawkins theorizes that biological life is the expression of what he calls selfish tendencies in natural selection at the level of the gene, he's directly describing a logic inherent to nature and ascribing the material reality of existent biological life to it. And of course, Marx's historical materialism does precisely the same thing only with respect to labor. And Hegel does this with respect to self-consciousness by working through the logic of self-consciousness. He's working in the realm of metacognition. That is, not simply how we think, but how we think about thinking, and what sorts of processes this involves and in what they result, and how that alters what we think about thinking, and so on. And that so on doesn't imply an infinite loop, but a gradual increase in complexity and self-understanding. It would be helpful if Paul clarified what he means by logic here, because as it stands, this section is basically absurd. Given that he regards logic as inherently more simple than things like matrices and vectors, my inclination is to think that what Paul's doing is reducing logic to simply formal logic so that he can treat deviations in the real world from logical formulae as somehow a delegitimation of logic simply, but then he explicitly represents these in his own slide formally, so I'm kind of at a loss. I think this section 
frankly just needed a do-over. It's just poorly thought out. I really can't think of any instances in which a useful understanding of any real process can be well modelled with the sort of abstraction that Hegel employs. We've got so many more tools to look at the world that have been developed in the last couple of hundred years that to go back to the 1820s would be a terrible retrograde step. The great danger is that if you do that, young people's minds get stuck in a time warp. You educate them in their 20s with concepts from the 1820s. And they go on employing modes of thought that have long since been abandoned in science. They, you cut them off from the threads of intellectual development that have led to the modern scientific world. I mean, just about the only useful thing conceptually in the lecture on Hegel that Timor gave is the, the, the slogan that to determine is to negate. And now that, that can be made more profound and you get some leftists citing this in Latin saying determino es negato. But there's nothing very specific about Hegel this. This is something every high school student learns about these days when they cover set theory and Venn diagrams. It's the same basic idea that if you define a set, you are defining the complement of the set. And everyone understands that who's been to school and has been taught these diagrams. The diagrams make it clear and easy to understand. Um, you don't have to go back to old philosophers on this. Now, who should you, if you were really wanting to focus on some historical background, who should you look at? To my mind, you, you, you should start with Lucretius and then you move on to, to the, the, the 19th century atomists like Maxwell and Boltzmann. And from then on, you trace down concepts in Boltzmann through Shannon, Crick and Watson because it's the understanding of information and what information is that transformed science in the latter half of the 20th century and obviously you should any person who wants to be a materialist should read Darwin as well and if you want to actually concentrate on on logic you'd be better to read the people who really have influenced logic, like Bull, Russell and Turing. And perhaps if you're more adventurous, go and read David Deutsch, whose paper on the universal quantum computer introduced the topic of quantum computing and is really a resolutely materialist and physicalist take on why mathematics is possible. Okay, so let's get the obvious objection out of the way first. The threads that lead to the development of the modern scientific world extend to, well, frankly, even far before Kant. So to cut it off at the 19th or 20th centuries is silly, and this is obvious even at a superficial level. This would mean, for instance, cutting out the contributions of someone like Isaac Newton. But in addition to this, the attitude towards science and philosophy that Paul's displaying here is incredibly naive. There is no guarantee that prevailing paradigms in science were established honorably, by which I mean through the total falsification of previous paradigms. As Thomas Kuhn and Andrew Pickering demonstrate, these paradigms assert themselves without necessarily actually obviating the viability of previous paradigms in science. The tendency is to chase a seemingly effective novelty, not to exhaust a previous paradigm of its total utility first. And so in philosophy of mind, for example, there is a lot of backtracking that's being done with philosophers of mind even referencing Aristotle, because prevailing models using some of the most advanced technology operate from impoverished theoretical foundations that seemed persuasive when they were first posed. Now as for this Venn or Hegel bit, this misses the point entirely, and it misses the point because Paul doesn't have enough respect for Hegel to pay attention to what Hegel is trying to do. Hegel is writing a phenomenology 
of spirit, or in some translations, mind. The relevant point isn't that to determine is to negate, but that in time, this negation leads to further determinations and negations, themselves forming the ground of yet further determinations and negations, culminating in ever greater levels of self-consciousness. Paul seems to think that there is a simple linear trajectory in scientific development where all theories deemed previous are inherently and for all time invalid, and all deemed current are true, but this is obviously wrong. The very fact that we experience shifts in paradigms belies this, and indeed here he recommends we read Lucretius, who is quite a bit older than Hegel, because he thinks it's more amenable to current science. And this is so much for his critique of Hegel, or more specifically the teaching of Hegel, or the usefulness of teaching Hegel. And I think I'm justified in saying that it's entirely without merit. So, in conclusion, while Cockshot is a smart man, and his videos are for the most part very interesting and sometimes quite good, I have to say, being smart isn't a substitute for actually knowing what you're talking about. And I wish he wouldn't so recklessly disparage thinkers like Hegel on the basis of clichés and third-hand remarks. It's patently obvious that he hasn't read Hegel for himself because he has been conditioned by his personal history or his environment or something to not respect Hegel enough to make certain that his negative opinions concerning his work or the usefulness of teaching about it are well-founded. And the result is surprise that the opinions he's given concerning Hegel in this video are founded on effectively nothing. So, like, come on, Paul, you're better than this. So, you know, try to show a little respect. 